Hi, and welcome, everybody. I'm glad you could join us. This is episode 11 of the Well Bible Reading Podcast Journey, and I hope that you that you have had a great week, and I hope you're going to have a great week. We're going to be studying some scriptures today that are just some of the most amazing scriptures. We are in Genesis chapters uh, 30, 31, 32, and 33. Uh, we're going to be focusing in on chapter 32 today in the Old Testament. In the New Testament, we're in Matthew chapter 11, and then we're also looking at Psalm chapter 11. Uh, so it's going to be a, it's going to be a lot of information today, and I'm glad that you're a part of our our podcast today. But I want to just start right away. I want to invite Craig and Amber in. Craig and Amber, thanks for being here. Hello, hello. Oh, hello again. Yeah. So Craig and Amber, we are in Genesis chapter 32 today. We're looking at this. This is a big chapter. There's a lot going on in this chapter. And it's a big chapter in terms of the whole history of the patriarch. So we're still in that patriarch era. And we're dealing with, uh, in some ways, the last of the patriarchs is Jacob. And Israel will be formed around his his sons, his eventually 12 sons. And so um, it's a big moment. So Amber, what are some of the things that you took away or some of the things that popped out at you here in Genesis chapter 32? Yeah, thank you, Alice. The very first thing is that there's so much suspense going on around this Jacob and Esau reunion. Um, There's so much suspense. It kind of leaves you up to what's going to happen. The last time we the last words we've heard from Esau was his words that he was going to swear that he was going to slay Jacob for stealing that blessing. And that was over 20 years ago. Mm -hmm. And now we're going to have this moment in today's reading where they are finally going to see each other again. And so you're, you're left to wonder a couple things. Um, Why in the heck is Esau bringing 400 people to meet Jacob? You're like, Oh, okay. Is this aggression? Is he going to attack him? Or is this, is he celebrating? Where's, where's Esau's heart here? Mm -hmm. And then because Jacob is a schemer and, and has kind of schemed, he kind of, you can tell he's nervous. He's really nervous. He's fearful for his life. And I, I remember even myself thinking to myself when I was reading this, will his past sin affect his current blessing? Mm -hmm. Is this going to cost him something? Yeah. And that's sort of where I started when I began reading these t- chapters. He kind of assumes that it's, that it is. Uh, mm-hmm. It's when you go through life being in a, manip- a manipulator uh, like this, really everything's about me and trying to, and trying to leverage every relationship towards my benefit. You just automatically assume everyone else is trying to do that to you as well. And so he comes in this assuming Esau is still, still very much angry. Did you get that uh, Craig? And in, in, as you read through it, yeah, I did definitely uh, pick up on the themes that y'all are both pointing out. In 32, we see Jacob setting up his his party to to go ahead of him in ways that will bring his kind of his stuff and his cute kids ahead of him to, to form. We presume he ho- Jacob hopes a ring of protection around him so that he can play on Esau's either sympathies or family ties or just greed. You know, here's some stuff for you if, if nothing else, um, which is it, you know, Interesting, as a patriarchal father, we would expect him that he wants to, as a leader of the clan, put himself out there before to protect his family. He would go first. You know, leaders lead from the front. There he is, you know, looks looks like he's cowering in the back behind his stuff and kids. It's, it's well, not yeah. a great look. Yeah, no, and he's he's a he's the offspring of, of these the two other guys, his, uh, you know, uh, Abraham and Isaac, who both, when they went to Egypt, put their wives out there to protect them. They were afraid and said, look, you can go ahead and have her. She's my sister, right? Knock off the block. (laughs) Yeah, so you've got this kind of here. Jacob is kind of doing the same thing. He's putting his wife and children out in front saying, okay, if he starts to slaughter them, then I know to run, right? He's, he's, he first, he sends the the gifts. And, and it's interesting because, you know, he stole the blessing from, uh, from Esau and, uh, then he's gone off to this other country and he has been blessed uh, based on that word. I think Amber, you pointed out in another time that that word blessed means to multiply. Is that right? Yeah, exactly. Throughout the entire Hebrew Bible, when we see the word blessing since creation, we're supposed to imagine in our mind um, multiplication or multiplication towards abundance, which mm-hmm. represents a lot of things, but specifically here, children, nations, that kind of thing. Yeah. So He's been blessed where he's been living. He comes back, and as it turns out, Esau's been blessed too. Uh, but he's bringing, he, it's almost like he's coming back saying, I stole your blessing. Let me be a blessing to you now. And he puts these, the goats and all the sheep, you know, everything that he's going to give to Esau as a kind of a peace offering, a gift, right? To try and pave the way for this reconciliation 
Uh, and I'm not sure because in, a number of scholars point out that in this scene, Jacob is not really repentant. He hasn't repented of anything. He's just still trying to get away with it. He's trying to appease his, his, his brother. He wants, he wants to, to buy his way back into his brother's uh, good graces. And then he finds out that Esau says, no, I've, I've been blessed. I don't need your stuff, right? I don't need your stuff. I've, I've been blessed too. Yeah. He's, not, he's not expecting forgiveness. That, that shocks him. Yeah, you know, before he starts sending all of his gifts, we kind of miss this section of prayer. He he prays to God. He goes, hey, um, so you remember how you promised me to bless me and, and make me many nations? But my, I think my brother might kill me. Will you will you save me, protect me from his, you know, his, yeah. his hand? And, and he does this prayer. And so you think to yourself, wow, he's relying on God. Like for a split mm-hmm. second, you think, oh yeah, Jacob, you're, you're praying to God. And then um, but true Jacob style, immediately, it looks like, it seems like he barely said the word amen, and he immediately starts making elaborate plans for himself to save him and his family, doesn't he? Yeah, it just he does. true, true Jacob style. And I, I came across this, um, this gentleman, um, Gregory Moeller, who's a, a great man of faith. He was asked, um, what, is the most, what is the most important part about prayer? And he replied, the 15 minutes after I said amen. Mm. And no matter how great Jacob's prayer was, his faith is, what's, is and what happens after really shows his faith. And so I thought of the song, I Surrender All, that we all talk about. We sing, I surrender. I'm not a singer. Mm. I'm not doing it. <laughs> but it's as if he's saying, um, okay, I surrender all my goats. I, is that, that's not enough. I surrender my sheep. If that's not enough, I sur- I'll surrender my camels. I'll surrender all these things. But the only thing he's not surrendering is himself. And I think it does going to cost him something. No, that's, that's absolutely right. Uh, he's still, he's still, that character is quite not there yet. You still see until the wrestling match was coming, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, it takes that because he's still not quite, quite there. He's still the old yeah. Jacob in some ways. Craig, go ahead. In contrast, to, to draw the point home, in contrast to Jacob's character, we have Esau, which almost, I think you pointed this out a few minutes ago, Ellis, he almost seems more at peace. He's, he's got his stuff. He's in some ways gotten a blessing with, you know, within the context of his own life, mm-hmm. not the blessing that Jacob has as, as the chosen one of God to, to bring forward Israel. But in the sense that he's happy, he seems content because in verse four of chapter 33, uh, just reading here, but Esau ran to meet him and embraced him and fell on his neck and kissed him and they wept. You almost get the same imagery and language that the father is portrayed as, as uh, responding to in the tale of the prodigal son when the prodigal son comes back home. That's how the father reacts. So we have that imagery here uh, before Jesus and maybe that's where Jesus draws it from in the, in the parable. But here we see Esau forgiving and truly want, you know, embracing reconciliation, embracing his brother. So compare that with what we've been talking about with Jacob. It really is a tale of two men, two brothers. No, that's awesome. And I, you, it's the exact same language. And he runs, he, 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 he embraces, he, he forgives. It's this, it's this amazing scene, powerful emotional scene. Uh, and, it, and it's interesting that in this, in this scene, Jacob, who's the chosen one and the one that, that will get the, the double inheritance and the blessing and all that, he's, he has that. But it's Esau who's acting more like God, more like Jesus, so to speak. He's the one who has the more the godly characteristics, uh, because when you compare him to the prodigal son story, he's the, he's the father uh, who represents God. And, uh, and Jacob is the prodigal son coming home. So that's, that's really, really good. Um, um, Ellis. Before we move into the wrestling story, which I think that's where we're headed, yes, um, I would love to just point out one more thing before we move into the wrestling part because it's awesome. Yes, um, I noticed, and it's because of back in week five, I um, brought to some attention for us to pay attention when things are moving east and west and what that mm-hmm. means. Mm-hmm. And I think this is another one of those examples. I just want to throw it out there. Um, you have. Just a reminder, when you're moving east, it seems as if you're moving away from God's um, presence, away from God's promises. And that's exactly what um, Jacob did when he moved towards um, Laban, his his uncle. That's Mm -hmm. when he moved that way. He was moving east away from the promised land, literally Mm -hmm. (laughs) and figuratively away from God. And you notice that before he goes to Laban, he um, has a dream of all these angels and he's still in the promised land when he has the latter dream. 
of mm -hmm. with all the angels. And here you have him moving back towards the promised land. And after he enters the promised land, he comes across um, this group of angels again, a different group of angels, but promised land. And I think mm -hmm. it's just really neat. I think it's just another one of those. He's moving back to the West, moving towards God's promise. Now it gets experienced these angels again. Just something yes. I want to point out before we move on. No, that's very good. And when he's running, when he's running away, he's running east towards the east. He's running uh, away from his problems. He's running away from his relationships, uh, all the mess that he had made through his manipulation and so forth. He's running away from that. Uh, and in a sense, running away from God, there's that. But when he's running back, he's coming back for reconciliation. Sure. Uh, but he keeps running. He, it, so even at this moment, so he's sending all these the gifts and the and the family and everything ahead, so that so that Esau will encounter them first. And he's he's laying back. It's almost like he's still running away from his problems, running away from his struggles. Uh, and so, to your point, Amber, now he's he's coming back towards God. He's going to have another experience with God. He had one on the way out of the promised land. He's having one on the way into the promised land. And it is this mysterious wrestling match. And it is a mysterious passage. Who is, who is the guy, who is the man that he's wrestling with? Is it God or isn't it God? Uh, because it says, you know, at the end, it's kind of, he wrestled with God, but then at the beginning, it was just man. Uh, so this is a really significant moment. Um, big time significant for the patriarchs, for the whole story. It's a turning point, really turning point because you have to remember that Jacob has 11 sons at this point but he's going to have 12 right when Benjamin will be born and this is the nation of Israel this these are the 12 tribes and so this this is a pretty big moment what did you guys get from this moment I think the first thing that jumped out at me was one anybody wrestles with God how's that even possible that's pretty cool but um through the experience Jacob is renamed to Israel which breaking it down, Yisra being the Hebrew word for to struggle or contend with, uh, it's a verb, and put with El, which is the Hebrew word for God, Israel, struggle with God, or God struggler, God wrestler. This becomes the identity of Jacob going forward, but more, more fully, it becomes the identity of Israel as a nation. Throughout Israel's history, we see them struggling with God, asking him the hard questions. In some ways, you know, they trying to hold God to account as much as any human being can. And we see that doesn't work well in the story of Job, but as much as they, they can, they try to ask him, you know, why are you doing this? Where are you at? Why have you forsaken me back you know, to the Psalms that Jesus pulls forward? But ultimately, you know, God is going to hold them accountable too, as we ultimately see in, in their, their uh, uh, exile in Babylon. Uh, mm -hmm. So you see this, contentious relationship which forms the bedrock and the foundation of that interaction between the two yeah i think that's right i think this really does set up what israel is going to be like in the relationship to god and it is also this 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 idea that it seems like the the god initiates this 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 wrestling match god god is the one who does it jacob is trying to do everything on his own he's trying you know to amber's point he said the prayer but as soon as he says amen now he goes and starts doing it on his own strength and how many times have we done that where we ask God for help? We ask for God to protect us. We ask for God to fight our battles and all that. But as soon as we say, amen, now we go start trying to do it, manipulate and do it our own way to, you know, to get, get what we want. And so you see this happening with Jacob uh, and it's going to take this slap in the face. I mean, he gets here a slap in the face. He gets God just really confronts him in a big, big way. So in the wrestling match, it seems that there's kind of three movements in it. At the first, it seems like Jacob has a little bit of the upper hand in the wrestling match. It kind of goes back and forth. Um, and so Jacob, again, he stops and, and it's time to stop. And Jacob says, no, I won't let you go into it until you bless me, right? He's still looking for a blessing. He, he, he had the blessing. He stole the blessing from his brother. Uh, but now he, it's, it's not enough. He, he, needs, he needs this blessing. So What's going on there with Jacob? And, um, and then that's when, of course, the second movement is where the, the angel or God or whoever this is uh, names him, right? That's what's your name. And so well, what's going on here? Yeah, I, I um, did a little reading on this and it, it's, it's puzzling at first. And then when you start really looking at it, I think some pieces come together. But, you know, he's asking for this blessing, the very thing that he has been scheming and manipulating and trying to get his whole story. He's been trying to get this blessing that God already promised him way back before he's even born. And 
here he is saying, no, 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 I'm not letting go of you until you bless me. And so, um, angel God, God basically is like, okay, I'm going to bless you. All right. And what happens is, is if you look at the details here, um, remember blessing is multiplication. I'm just setting up the scene. Blessing is multiplication. How, and of children of nations, things like that. How do men, where's their source of multiplication? It's in the crotch. And that's exactly where God strikes him. God is like, okay, I'll bless you. Here's the blessing right into your blessing maker. (laughs) And I'm in here it is. And it takes a strike for Jacob to wake up, have a wake up call and finally receive the blessing he has been meaning to have. And you see a shift in Jacob's um, rest, the rest of his story. Yeah. That's what I love about the scripture. I mean, it is really raw, but it's, Mm -hmm. it's, he, he kicks him. He gives him a swift kick in the crotch which disjoints his his hip right get my yep. joint so now he has what seems in, in the story i don't know if you guys read anything else but it seems to be a permanent thing was this a permanent yeah limp? that's what i read that he limps basically it's a reminder of the rest of his life he limps the rest of his life right right yeah he, he can't even run from esau anymore it would seem mm, right point. i like it that's no longer an option right uh and I'm sure that that's not what Jacob had in mind when he asked for a blessing, right? He wasn't expecting a kick in the, in the, in the growing, right? Yeah. Uh, or in the crotch. He was expecting something different. And this is, know, this is what he got. Go ahead, Craig. It, it really comes, it's a, good, uh, it's a good object lesson in the fact that God is really going to give us each one individually what we need when he comes to us and either challenges us or tests us in ways that we individually need to grow. He wrestled with Jacob because that's what Jacob needed. Jacob being this guy who was always wrestling and contending with, with life, trying to get a little bit more out of the, out of the, the, the angle, you know, pull, drip, to drip a little bit more out of the squeeze, if you will. And here he gets the ultimate, you know, squeeze. You can't get more out of, the, out of life than God. And, and he wrestles with the ultimate. And without knowing it, without knowing that that's what he needed, that's what he got. And, and boy, did God deliver, to your point, Amber. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. He's, it's a, it's a moment that actually, this is, it seems to me in the, in the whole story of Jacob, this is the moment that really changes him. Yeah. Like he's not the same after this. Um, not just physically you're saying. Yeah. Right. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> he's definitely physically not the same, <laughs> but he, he, he has changed in this, in this encounter with Esau. Part of that, I think obviously has to do with, with God, uh, what God is doing with him and it is God doing it. But then the other part too, that had to have a big impact on him, was the forgiveness of his brother Esau. Esau really shines in this scene. Uh, Esau is the, is the more righteous of the two at this moment, right? Because he's the one who forgives and, and the one who says, I, I've, I, I'm good. God has blessed me, right? And don't forget that Esau had that, that promise too of a, of a great nation, and he was, he was going to have an you know, be an impact as well. So, uh, yeah, it's a really interesting, interesting moment where, where Jacob comes back home. Yeah, it seems as if it's less to do with his plans and more to do with Jacob's prayer that finally gives him the success, the success of what, with his brother. That's right. You bring up the prayer, and I completely I forgot about that. We kind of went over that because there's so much in this chapter. By the way, you guys need to read this chapter carefully. There's so much in this chapter. We can't get to all of it. But this is the longest uh, prolonged prayer uh, in Genesis, in the book of Genesis. And it's Jacob's prayer to God. Uh, and it's, um, it's, a, it's one of those prayers of desperation. Uh, Jacob really thinks that he's going to die. I mean, it's this army coming at him, his brother, to Amber's point earlier, why did he bring 400 men? And the way that God, the way the narrator builds the suspense or the tension that Amber talked about earlier in the story, absolutely, there's all this suspense and tension in the story all the way to the end when Esau shows that he's going to forgive. You don't know until that moment what he's going to do. And the way he builds attention is he just stretches the story out. He prolongs it and prolongs it and prolongs it until you finally get there. But Amber, this prayer is this prayer of, uh, of a desperate person, right? Desperate man. Yeah. And, um, um, and it's, it's almost like as soon as he says amen, he's back to uh, the, the same old Jacob plotting and manipulating and trying to get his way. You know, you know what I noticed in this prayer is that it says, you are the God of my father and you're God of my grandfather. He never calls him his God himself until after the wrestling, this 
every time he encounters God or prays to God, it's never my God. It's always the God of my father, the God of my grandfather, the God who gave me this promise, but he never claims it for himself until after this wrestling match. So you literally do see a change in Jacob, which is really cool. But an interesting fact that I, I looked up, because I think these things are interesting, is that from here on out for the rest of the Jacob story, pay attention because Jacob, um, he is called Jacob twice as often as Israel, the rest of his story. So apparently there's still plenty of old man left in Jacob, <laughs> the old Jacob left in the story. And when he's referred to Jacob, it's usually not something good. When he's referred right. to Israel, it's connection to this this blessing and the right. and the legacy of, of, of Abraham, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Yes. And we even see that played out at the end of chapter 33 when Esau asked him to follow him back to Shear and and Jacob says, okay, I'll do that. And he goes the other, he goes the other way. It's yeah, like, he goes a different even direction. after that, he's just, he's more, maybe he's more Jacob and Israel most days. <laughs> yeah, and that's, we all? that's all of us, right? Yeah. Right. All yeah. of us. He is trying to change us. And all of us have had those prayers, giving it to God, asking God to take care of it, asking God to protect us. And as soon as we say, amen, now we're trying to figure out how we're going to work it to, to make sure that we're protected. We keep giving things to God, and then as, as soon as we say amen, we take them back, right? Uh, and we, we want to control. So that's that's Genesis 32. There's a lot there, guys. You need to really dig down into this. We want to spend at least a little bit of time on Matthew chapter 11, uh, also a really great chapter, where uh, we get a little bit of a deeper dive into this relationship between Jesus and John the Baptist, right? And and really the bigger picture is this, what's happening with Jesus's movement where people are rejecting him, people are questioning, people are doubting, uh, even his own disciples, right? So what, what did you get out of that chapter, uh, guys? What what came to you? The, the only thing that I, I do this every time I get to the New Testament, maybe because of the New, New Testament, sometimes I get overwhelmed with, this, with the Gospels maybe, but I seem like every time I start looking back at our chapters for each week in the New Testament, I feel like I have to do an overview of what's happening here. It just helps me. So I'm, I'm assuming it helps other people uh, do this roadmap. It does. It does. Um, so you have John who's heard the deeds of Christ. And so what those are is basically all the stories we've been looking at since chapter five. All these, since chapter five is these deeds of Christ. And these deeds have provoked all sorts of responses from different people. Normally these responses are either misunderstanding or outright rejection. I think last week or the week before I said, responding to Jesus is either going to do three, one of three things, either going to have your um, mind open, mind blown, or you're going to have a closed mind. And I think this is what is happening here. And what's going to happen further as we move past chapter 11 and chapter 12 is going to be more examples of these, these responses of Jesus, mostly misunderstanding and rejection. Chapter 13, you're going to see the same thing, but in parable form. Yay, I love parables. Thank you, Jesus. Mm -hmm. They're so great. Um, and then you're going to see additionally 14 through 16 are still more responses all the way leading up to Peter's confession and once you get to Peter's confession you you get a second main part of the gospels and that's where the it climaxes at that point and that's where Jesus really steps publicly into his messiahship prior to this he's not really saying I am or I'm not he, he's just saying I'm doing these good deeds I'm yes the kingdom has come the kingdom is coming the kingdom is here he's saying these words but it's not till after chapter 16, does he really step fully into his messiahship? And I think that's where the, it changes. So from here until then, it's all these stories of how people misunderstand and misunderstand what Jesus is up to. Yeah. Yeah. And, 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 and the ones that you, the one that kind of you least expected to do that is John the Baptist, right? Yeah, exactly. The one who, right. the one who started it all, the one who prepared the way, the one who preached so hard and, and, and the one who looked at Jesus and said, there goes the lamb of God. I, I experienced it, but now he's in prison. John the Baptist is in prison. Historically speaking, we believe he's at probably at the Herod's uh, kind of fortress. At it was a military fortress at Macaros, which is in southern Perea. It's on the other side of the Jordan River from the Holy Land. It's an area that that Herod controlled. So he's in prison, and there's a war going on. He's in prison because he's been talking against. He's talking been be, talking bad about Herod Antipas, and Herod Antipas is the one in this war with the king of of Aramea of Aramea, the Aramean king, uh, over, oh, it, it's a political war. It's over, he had married her daughter, he tried to kill his daughter, his daughter escaped, and it started this whole war. And so, um, so he's in trouble, and actually he's losing the war. 
and the people are saying we're getting all this from the Jew, Josephus, the the uh, Jewish historian, tells us this whole story. But he basically, the people are saying you're losing the war because you killed John the Baptist. So at some point during this whole time, he he executes John the Baptist, and we get that story in the in the New Testament as well. But right now, John the Baptist, when he sends his guys to go ask Jesus this, he's sitting in a prison cell in Mac in Mac, at Macaros, this military fortress right on the front lines where the war is happening. The war is happening all around John the Baptist and he's in this prison cell. And so he knows he's, he's most likely not going to get out of there alive. And he doesn't. So he's, he's at the end. I mean, he's at the end. He's not an old man. He's, he's a pretty young guy and he's at, he, but he's facing death. So this is when the doubt comes in, right? Yeah. And, he, and he wants to know, are you the one or should we look for someone else? Yeah, I think these are questions all of us naturally asked also at some point in our own journey. And even after we come to faith, these questions come back to us from time to time. And that struggle, that going back to the wrestling thing, that struggle with, uh, with God, that, that doubting as part of our faith is, is okay. God can handle it. Uh, if, you know, Job embraced it, Lamentations embraces it. The questions, the psalmist asked the questions all throughout uh, the Psalms. God can take our questioning. At the end of the day, it comes down though to Amber's point. What is going to be our question or our response to Jesus' Jesus's ultimate question of who do you say that I am? Mm-hmm. Are we going to respond like Peter because we've seen the truth and and come to faith and and belief? Or are we going to maybe follow your your analogy, uh, Amber? Be be closed-minded, you know, or blown, and we have to go think about it some more. Yeah. So you know, it really comes down to, we ask the questions and it's okay, but you still have to wrestle with the answers. Mm-hmm. Very good. Yeah. yeah. And there's nothing wrong with that. It's, it's a natural thing. Right. I, Ellis, I, I think you mentioned that we really don't know for sure exactly what, what is going on in John the Baptist's mind. We don't really truly know the reason for his questioning. No. We have, we, we can assume based on history and the things we know in books. And so as I was pondering this, um, I always sometimes think, well, you know, if I was writing in prison and I have been preaching and telling people to repent now because the kingdom of God is here and the wrath of God is coming. And all of a sudden I hear about Jesus having dinner parties with sinners. I'd be like, where's the wrath? <laughs> you know, and I, I could imagine myself sitting there going, I'm in prison for this and, and I'm rotting and you're having parties and making wine and, yeah. you know, and, and hanging out with tax collectors. I can just imagine that being bringing on questions. Like this is not exactly what I thought the wrath is going to look like. And I think that's so true. That's not, it's not what we still assume Jesus is all about. It's, it's, a, it's, it's what his kingdom is about still blows my mind. No, that's excellent. And it's, it's what having was happening with kind of almost everyone that they were misunderstanding what this looks like. And that's a very real possibility with John the Baptist is that, okay, when I preach that you are the Messiah, this, this is not exactly what I had in mind. They all had different things in mind. And John the Baptist came from what seemed to be a more Essene kind of background. And they were certainly waiting for a Messiah. There was this belief in a Messiah who would come, but it was a Messiah who would come to basically overthrow the shackles of oppression that the Romans had put on them, the Roman empire. And Jesus doesn't seem to be doing any of that. He seems to be doing, as you said, building community, having fun with guys, mm-hmm. building relationships. And, uh, and John, John certainly could look at that. And, and we all, it's, it's this misunderstanding of Jesus. And there's, the, the, there's even a book not that long ago written by, um, I don't remember the, the author, the misunderstood Jesus, right? Mm-hmm it's real easy to misunderstand what Jesus is all about and to kind of miss it. And it seems like John the Baptist wants to be sure that he's not missing something. So I think that's actually a valid point that he could very well have misunderstood what Jesus, because the interesting thing is here's, here's the thing too. That's pretty cool. Is that when, when they come and ask him that, are you the one should be looking for someone else? He doesn't say yes. He doesn't say, yeah, I'm the one go back and tell him I'm the one. Right. Uh, What does he say? He says, Tell him what you see and hear. Yeah, right? the very deeds that he was questioning. The deeds, yeah. I want a show. Tell him what you're seeing. That it's what it's it's when we see it, right? It's when we see it. If you have, if you're having doubts, if you're struggling with the Jesus, he doesn't send him. And this is counterintuitive to our culture and our world. He mm-hmm. doesn't send him to. Well, let me go back, and I'm going to give you this list of things that I believe, right? To the beliefs. Uh, go back and tell. Just or go back and just tell John I said so. You know, I, 
I'm in. I said, so just go back and no, no, tell him about what you're seeing, what's happening. The, the lame are walking, the blind are seeing, right? The oppressed are being freed from their oppression. This is, this is why I came. This is the work of the Messiah. So, um, so I think when we get down, we need to open our eyes and see what God is doing all around us. He's doing some amazing things, right? I think, we for, I think we forget that Jesus has a very different enemy in mind than all these people did. I mean, he has a very spiritual enemy in mind that has been causing um, havoc since the beginning. He has hijacked humanity's history, that he's hijacked human our human hearts. And ultimately, Jesus is here to, is not to solve people's problems. That's not why Jesus was there. He's not there to solve their problems. Jesus is, was there to conquer evil and allow evil to conquer him. And that doesn't mean that his plan was failed or that it was something was wrong with that plan. But his ultimate goal is not, to not allow sin and death to have the final word. And that's exactly what happens. I think he just gets so misunderstood because he talks a lot about this. Don't you have ears, to, you know, eyes to see is what he's talking about here. Like, don't right. you see what's really happening here? Right. And we get frustrated with the disciples when they always seem to misunderstand or not understand and Mm -hmm. but we we do the same thing we Mm -hmm. we take god's word and we twist it and to our own ends sometimes uh, we don't we don't really always understand exactly what's happening so um yeah it's it's a great lesson for us coming out of this with john the baptist um uh, and jesus does this thing where he says you know john's asking jesus to clarify his identity after they go back, Jesus turns to his disciples and he asks the identity question about John. Who did you go out to see? Who do you think this guy is? And he, he goes to John's identity. He says, he is, he is the one that was prophesied about, right? Yeah. Uh, he is the voice calling in the wilderness. Um, but he makes this comparison to his identity and the identity of the one in the kingdom of God, who's, who's, who's in part of the kingdom of God. John the Baptist, he says, was great. Of all the men born of women, he's tops, right? Tops. Um, but compared to the kingdom of God, right, the least is greater than that. What was he doing there? What do you think he was saying with that? Well, yeah, not the, it, go ahead. Go ahead, Craig. Yeah, just real quick, and I'll hand it over to you, Amber. Um, you know, the, Matthew doesn't do anything accidentally in the way he structures his gospel. He, we follow that question by Jesus to his disciples with, uh, Jesus's uh, call to repentance and woe to the two Galilean cities in mm-hmm. verses 20 through 24. And then in verses 25 through 30 of, of chapter 11, we have Jesus's prayer for the elected and for those, and he, get, he issues the invitation for those who are in him to rest and to share his yoke because it's light. And so it, it's the yoke that it's not for an easy life to, to the point you all have already made. The Christian life is a struggle and Jesus isn't going to solve our problems. But it's the it's the taking the yoke off the misinterpretation of the law that the, the Pharisees and other teachers of Israel had put on the the, the people of Israel and and by extent the world uh, to say that's not what you guys should be focused on. I am the fulfillment of the law and the prophets and and that way to uh, to righteousness that we've been talking about throughout these podcasts. That way to righteousness and to life is through me because this is what connection to God is, is life. And that's, and it's what it's made of. And that connection is made through Jesus. And so it's that that life of repentance and that life to rest in him that is ultimately, you know, is the answer to the question that he asked his disciples. That's good. Yeah. And that whole passage at the very end, the yoke, my yoke is easy. It's a great passage. He's talking about his way. It's love God, love neighbor, treat your neighbor as yourself. It's the Sermon on the Mount. Yeah. Amber, you wanted to say something? No, Craig, you, you said that better than I could have ever um, said that. So well done. I, I do know that we're going to be ending soon. And I just had some reflections for our listeners to end yeah. today, if that's a good time. Absolutely. Yeah. Awesome. Um, this is really would go better with the Genesis passage, but I think it could relate here as well. Um, just if you are listening, just write down these questions real fast, grab your phone, grab a pen. Um, here's something I want you to ponder this week is what's one thing you have chase after in life, whether that be approval, love, et cetera, fill in the blank. How have you chased it? And then number two, has God himself already given or promised that very thing you have chased after in life? Yeah. Oh, that's great. It comes right out of the Genesis passage, uh, even in Matthew, where where uh, John the Baptist has been chasing this thing his whole life. This is what he was created for. This is what he's been 
you know, for, and it's like already been given to him, but yet he's strug still struggling with it, right? So great questions. What are you chasing? What are you chasing? And how are you chasing after that? And is it possible that you've already been given this thing that you're chasing, right? Yeah. And you just need to open your eyes and your hearts to it. God has already God ears can hear and eyes to see. That's right. Jesus is always saying that, right? Uh, so that's great. Hey, thanks, guys. It's been amazing today. This is these are some great chapters that we're going through in Genesis. I've been hearing from many of you that you're just enjoying this time through Genesis. I pray that God will bless you as you continue to serve him, as you continue to go to his word every day. I know he's going to speak to you and do great things to through your life. And I can't wait to see you again next time. We'll see you next week on this podcast. God bless you. Thanks.